connect to your heart, stay committed to your truth, honor your desires, tune back into your purpose when you feel lost or confused, choose joy and flow every day, Mm -hmm. and just figure out what works for you. When you can do more and more of those things and stay devoted to the mission and the vision of your calling, this is when pure magic can happen. Welcome to the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I'm serial entrepreneur and investor, Emmy Kirshner, and I'm known for sprinkling just a little bit of glitter throughout the streets of Philadelphia and on the stages that I speak while I help creative entrepreneurs stop struggling as the overworked admin in their business and become the CEO of their multi-six and seven-figure businesses. What has fascinated me over the years are the stories of success and failure that courageous entrepreneurs who have put it all on the line face as they change lives, disrupt industries, and become incredible leaders themselves. So if you're looking for a community of engaged entrepreneurs and you'd love to get some resources and tools that can help you fast track your business, I invite you to join the Tribe of Leaders Facebook group. The link is in the show notes if you want to connect with us. And of course, the group is free to join. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am your host, Emmy Kirshner. And today I have the one and only incredibly brilliant Stephanie Hess, who is a Fortune 500 director turned entrepreneur, business strategist, consultant, and on or in demand speaker with 15 years of business and marketing experience and has been featured in Business Insider, Thrive Global, Medium, Yahoo Finance, and many, many other locations. Stephanie, welcome to the show. I am so super excited to have you here. Emmy, I am so thrilled to be here with you. My PA sister. Yes. Yeah. I'm here in Philly. You're in Lancaster. So it's, we're almost right next door to each other. And what part of why I'm so excited to have you on the show is because you and I align as business coaches and being you know, big hearted and really helping people not only step out of their comfort zone, but really visualize and you know, get big with their dreams and then go help them take that action and make it happen. So share with everybody a little bit about like your journey and how you've gone from Fortune 500 to coaching and becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, absolutely. So I spent about 10 years climbing the ranks in the global beauty and pro sports worlds, lipsticks and basketballs are an odd pair. I know, but they were my passions at the time. And so by day I was a director at a cosmetics company where I managed and mentored a big team of high producers from millennials to baby boomers. And by night I would run around Madison square garden and help people who were a hundred times smarter than I was from general managers to politicians to Olympians. And so this chapter ended in about 2017 and I've been coaching ever since. And so that's kind of what, what people tend to know about my story. But what a lot of people don't know is that for those 10 years, despite having a couple of shiny jobs, I was earning more money than my parents ever had combined or anyone in my family for that matter, coming from really working class, humble roots. Mm -hmm. I had equity in this $5 billion company and Emmy deep down the whole time. I just felt this shame and unworthiness in the beauty world. I was never thin enough. The head of our department, uh, she would come onto the floor. Everyone would know that she had arrived. She would walk around and critique our bodies and our outfits. And I kind of just thought that's what the beauty industry was. And so I remember the girls with the really petite and cute size two, you know, bodies would, would always be celebrated. They would always be given the photo shoots and, Mm -hmm. and things like this. And so this tension turned into bulimia for me, where I would find myself devouring a gigantic tray of cookies at eight o'clock at night in the office, being the last one to go home. And so 
then on the other hand, in the sports world, I was this curvy person working in a male dominated field in the NBA. And so I experienced a whole different side of objectification, if you will. So let me tell you my body confidence and my image, my, my body image in my twenties, it really hit a low point and I started having to fake it a lot. I felt so uncomfortable in my body. And so I overcompensated for being really nice and sweet and accommodating. And so around 2015, I had my metaphorical breaking point and I just kind of full out rebelled against everything. (laughs) And so throughout all of that conflict and confusion, there was this voice inside of me that I just couldn't ignore. It got to a point where it was getting a bit louder and a bit louder. And I heard it there. And I believe that this voice, this seed is inside all of us, Mm -hmm. but many women will go their entire life or career without really activating that. And so that's what I do today. Essentially, I help powerful people who at one point in their life felt powerless, like I did for many years, Mm -hmm. really be able to fully activate their feminine leadership so that they can elegantly build the amazing businesses and attract the high fee, high performing clients that they so deeply know that they're meant to serve without the internal or external noise or bullshit. Right. Because there's so much of it. So much of it. And and I think like I'm thinking about like how difficult that must have been for you to be in beauty where everybody's a twig. And then here you are showing up in the sports world where it is male dominated and like the contrast of that and not only being totally stressed out, but I mean, obviously you weren't handling it well, which led to your kind of breakthrough moment, but how is that affecting your day to day? Because that's like the contrast to me is so huge that it must have been an incredible weight to bear. You know, I think that we all have some version of contrast in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And when I was in the thick of it, I chose to be incredibly optimistic and I wanted to show up and do a good job. And I wanted to be that nice girl Mm -hmm. and I wanted to be that friendly person, all, you know, aspects of my personality that are true, but I really just kind of leaned into that really hard. And so on the job front, I found myself saying yes to a lot of things that in hindsight, I really should have been saying no to. Right. Right. And I'm so grateful. It was such a teacher looking back. And it kind of, it, it's just always the hindsight piece, no matter where, wherever we are, it's, it's easier to look back and have the realizations as to, oh, that's what was actually happening there. It's so less easy when we're in the thick of it. Right. Right. And how do you take that experience and help your clients now? Because you are not the only one who has suffered from the people pleasing disorder or syndrome, whatever you'd like to call it. And I'm sure, you know, like me, like a lot of things I've experienced in the past is what shows up in my clients. So it's a natural fit for me to be able to help them move through that. Yeah. A lot of personal development. Okay. A lot of coaching. Mm -hmm. A lot of, of finding out more about who I really am. And I think this, this is the beauty of, of aging, right? We get to travel, travel home to the true parts of, of who we are. And I love that. And with each passing year, I get more intimate with her. Mm -hmm. And so I love just being able to help reflect for people, the magic of who they are, even if they can't see it, because so, so often when we're in the thick of something, we don't really connect to the parts of us that are pure magic, especially when things are stressful or hard or we're challenging. And so I just like to be able to help be that light for people. Um, the light that I wish that, that I would have had. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. For somebody too, who's like, am I a people pleaser? What are some of the telltale signs or traits, and I'm air quoting for people who can't see, that help you stop doing that? Mm, Having awareness. Okay. I didn't even 
realize to the degree that I was doing, doing certain things that really were sabotaging my own happiness. A lot of, of saying yes, Mm -hmm. wanting to be overly accommodating, even if it meant putting my health at risk. And this was a cycle for me that I kind of, it was, it was just a a recurring theme, an ongoing pattern. And so now I tend to always tune into what feels like a hell yes. And if it's not that hell yes, for me, it just needs to be a no. And that has kind of become the gauge that I use because otherwise I will just still make commitments that I really am not in a position to make or that I really want to make. Right. Like you're in that space where you're showing up for the thing and you're like, this is so not me (laughs) in hindsight. Yes. I mean, I can think of so many events or meetings or calls or conversations that I said yes to that when I was having them felt like an absolute just soul crushing. Like, oh, why did I say yes to this? Why am I here? I could be, I could be spending my time doing things I actually love, things that bring me joy. And I think too, part of it was I I didn't really understand that I got to experience joy, that it is my birthright to be joyful and to do things that make me happy and make me feel good. Right. For so long, I think there was conditioning and programming that you know, coming from a very hardworking family, you know, you have to work hard, working hard means that you're good and and you get things done and you're a producer. This is how you show up. This is what we do. And to the detriment of our own health and wealth, much of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's funny because I've had to work through that belief that working hard and like, and sacrificing yourself essentially equals like success and profitability and happiness. And it doesn't, it's, you know, and it's one of the things I spend a lot of time evaluating with, you know, my business is, am I doing the things that are going to get the results? Not the, am I just doing the busy work? And then obviously when I'm teaching my clients too, because you want to look at the things that are driving results as opposed to just the to-do list. Yeah. I love that you're saying that and realigning like, It doesn't have to be hard. It gets to be easy. Yeah. Not easy all the time. Of course, there will always be tension and challenge. And I I really believe that we should be leaning into that edge. But no, business gets to, there gets to be ease. There gets to be flow. And I really, really believe that hustle and rest are a part of our sacred flow. There's time for hustle. We were just talking about this. There is time for hustle to have our our six week sprints. And then there is time for deep divine rest, getting out of town for a week or a month and just being, living. Yeah, sit on the beach, the woods, a rock, whatever. And like allow, you know, thoughts to come and go. And it's funny because I think about television shows that I've, watched over the years where like the leader goes and and you know goes to this faraway place and you know has this contemplative time and then comes back with like the plan you know and and I'm thinking of Vikings the tv show Vikings because my kids and I watch that that's what pops up for me the most but it's in you know pretty much any epic story and we don't do that we don't do it how do you lead if you're not taking time to think it is the most selfless thing one can do, truly. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm curious, like, as you're growing your business and this has been a crazy year, what would you do differently like if you were starting your business over again? Mm, so much. <laughs> Where do I begin? Oh my goodness. So there are a few things. What I would want myself to know then that I know now Mm -hmm. is that this is about creating a life full of happiness, full of joy, purpose, meaning a life where you love what you do each day. 
And I think that business should feel good. It should be fun and it should make money as a result. And this isn't about turning our heart centered businesses into cold corporate machines. And I think that being intuitive and conscious and spiritual is our edge and you can absolutely grow an incredibly successful business and do it your way. So if I were to have understood some of those concepts early on, it would have saved me so much time and energy and money so much. And I would have slept far more sound. I would have gotten a lot more sleep. I would have enrolled truly ideal clients far faster. And the biggest thing is I would have focused on one avatar, Mm -hmm. one offer and one organic traffic source. That is it. And that said, I'm grateful for the journey because the journey is the journey and all that I had to learn to get to where I am. I I believe it was that moment that is helping us to sharpen our sword. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. And I'm laughing because I've done the same thing and I watch my clients do the same thing. And as soon as I see them wander off down into, I'm going to create this new thing. I like yank them back down into one path, one thing, one, just do one. Then you can do something else. Yeah. Nail the basics, nail the foundation. There's that book, the the power of one. I highly recommend it. It is so true and it's applicable to so many different things, but business, especially follow the one thing, the one ideal client, the create the one smashing offer, get that in place, get your business to 10, 20 K months that way. And then anything else is the cherry on top, the sprinkles to your Sunday. Yeah, absolutely. And I love what you're saying too, about business being heart-centered and having more of that feminine energy, because there is a space, especially now, and I think to, to really and truly heal how divided our country is and how divided I think the times are, is to bring in more of that heart-centered understanding and to balance out some of the masculine energy Mm. and our visions align so beautifully, the more that I'm getting to know you, because that's exactly what I think the opportunity is, is for us to bring along all of these heart-centered entrepreneurs and help them grow and build essentially empires. Yes, Yes, absolutely. I'm really excited about it. And I know it's a taboo to bring in politics, but when, but when we look at these women that are being brought into these really high ranking roles, that is what excites me. And this doesn't mean that as a woman, you can't be masculine in your drive. I used to be probably fully in my masculine and that's where I was really off balanced, but meaning that more of the femininity, more of the feminine energy when we can bring that into what we're doing, what we're creating, who we're being, how we're showing up in the world, when we can balance that with this ambition that we have, with this fire in our belly, with this drive, that I believe is when pure magic can happen and it can lead to healing. It can lead to innovation. It can lead to forgiveness, to peace, to love, to compassion, to so much. And so that is what I, I just continue it, it. I shoot out of bed every morning when I continue to see more, more women, more of the feminine energy becoming more of the culture. Yeah, absolutely. And I also want to add, like, if you're a guy listening to this podcast, it's okay to have that feminine energy in your space as well, because it's really about the yin yang and the balance of both and what that looks like. And you have the opportunity to create the same and and contribute the same amount of amazingness to Mm -hmm. just for women. But I think there's a place for women to stand up and, and grow in a way that we haven't previously. It's such an important point. And I have so many beautiful, compassionate, heart-centered men in my field. And I have to tell you, they are some of the most powerful beings on this planet. And we absolutely need more men who can teach our men that it is beautiful to be loving and understanding and warm and anchored in your intuition and and your heart. Mm -hmm. I think it is so beautiful. And I just, I love that you added that. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think I mean, we've got this really cool thing kind of growing and spreading. So it's, it's fun to watch. And I too love seeing some of the women, all of the women come into politics. And regardless of what side of the field they're on, it's an opportunity for us all to grow and to come together. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm curious too, as we've talked about like, you know, what you've learned from the past and everything. What are your plans going into 2021 where we've all had to pivot so much? I have three words that are guiding my 2021 and that is fun, flow, and funds. That is my mantra for the year and I'm sticking to it. Love it. Do you want to share a little more about each one of those? Like what they mean for you? Yeah. You know, I am really enjoying learning more about what it means to run a business from a place of greater consciousness Mm -hmm. to be more in tune to what I need to be the best leader and servant that I can be. And it's a journey. It's a process for all of us, especially where we come from. And so for me, it's just kind of continuing to constantly peel back layer by layer and go deeper in really just how can I be the fully expressed uh, most authentic version of myself. And this for me personally, it looks like working with really amazing leaders to dial in my voice and my truth and my message even further. I often hear from people who just think that I'm an, an incredibly confident person, which I am, but I still have a lot of doubts many days I'm doubting things and I'm still not always fully comfortable leaning into the truth of my message. So there is still work that I need to be doing there. And I'm really excited to continue to do it so I can continue to attract more of the perfect fit people who I am meant to serve. And I really believe that that is true for all of us. The more that we can connect to our own voice and our own seed, the more we can attract those very soulmate people who are here to work with us and and to come into our fold. So those are kind of some of the things I'm excited about. All of that I know will create more space for flow, which is important important to me and more fun. And that's really important to me too, because I can take this business thing way too seriously. Let's just be real. I'm a high performer. I am, I have, I've always been an achiever and I can get dreadfully serious about it all. And so I just want to really have more fun with it and do all of these things while doubling and tripling revenues. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I mean, you've got my two, well, all three words are, are my favorite, but flow and fun are my two primary ones. I really believe in flow over balance mm-hmm. because things are going to come in huge waves and then have, you know, contraction at any given time. And that's just life. Like there's no way to balance that. And I want to play all the time. So I'm always looking for how can I make you know, the stuff that I don't like doing far more enjoyable, which, which makes kind of, and I'm air quoting again, but the work more pleasurable too. I'm curious because there's a lot of coaches and there's a lot of business coaches and it's an industry. What drives you craziest or most crazy about the coaching industry or any industry in general? Love to know what your your pet peeves are. My pet peeves. So I have a few. Great. Let's dive in. So a big one is coaches who are starting out or even coaches who have been in it for, let's say a year or two, who see themselves as new coaches when in fact they have generally probably been coaching their entire lives unofficially. And they're coming to the table with a lifetime resume, but yet they charge a hundred dollars an hour or their three month coaching package is $500 or things of, of that sort. I like to inspire people to really understand that coaching isn't a title. It's a tool and it's a tool that you have in your mighty toolkit. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that when people think that they need, or when, when coaches or creators feel that they need a perfect website, a complex funnel, a high traffic blog, a bunch of followers, a New York times, bestseller, multiple offers. I could go on and on and on. 
and have all of this before they can make a decent, a great living as a coach. That's just not true. Right. Yeah. I, I have to get on the bandwagon with that one. And I think that's true for any entrepreneur. Like it's so much easier to hide behind creating your website in particular than it is to go out and get clients or yeah. sell your product. I've mm-hmm. launched and had successful programs with no marketing. Yeah. Right. Like it's, I called people and I started like, Hey, this is what I'm doing. Do you know anybody? Mm, I love that you say that because that I I was going to add one last pet peeve and it's the lack of humanity in marketing and messaging and conversation today. So what you just said is, is exactly it. When did we stop treating relationships or people that we could potentially engage in business with? When did we stop treating that like a relationship that it is and it, and it requires nurturing? Um, and I think that a lot of times there's this at the pace in which we're moving in today's modern world with technology and all the things at our fingertips, it's, it's feels so appealing to want to jump straight into bed with someone who we're potentially going to do business with. And that's not to say that you, I mean, I believe that if you have your offer dialed in and your messaging is clear, you could attract an ideal client. They could read your thing and know that they want to work with you. And that happened pretty quickly. I do believe that is possible in the place that we want to get to and know that this is a long game. Are you in it to play the long game? And are you willing to put the time in to nurture relationships, to call people, to send thoughtful emails, to follow up, to do all the things that are required to nurture and foster a relationship? And this is especially true, I believe, if you're more interested in building a high ticket practice the relationships are going to be key and there needs to be a level of humanity in what you're doing and what, and what you're putting out there. Yeah. Do you find that there are better results? Like the clients get better results when they invest in higher ticket coaching programs? 100%. Okay. I think that there is so much information out there and I prefer to be a stance for someone to no longer give band-aids like it's one thing to, to give someone more information, but is that actually creating a transformation for them? So you could very well put together a simple course to address one core problem that your avatar has and, and charge a hundred bucks for it. Likely that's not going to cure their real problem. Mm-hmm. Or you could have an offer that addresses exactly what they need from A to Z and a container to support that process and transformation for them and solve that thing for good. Yeah. And that is the way that I prefer to support my clients. Yeah. Well, and I agree. I, I, in everything that I do, I'm looking for the solution, not the bandaid. Like let's unravel the mess and figure out how to put it back together. So it actually works instead of sticking duct tape on top of the bandaid. And I don't know about you, but I certainly have invested over the years in smaller programs and not done the work because there was nobody there to hold me accountable. And, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs who have done that, whether it's Instagram or the funnel or, you know, branding or whatever, when we have somebody that's holding us accountable, there's more valuable or value to that. So Absolutely. I love what you're saying. Yeah. Now you have a really cool way of kind of getting to know your clients and them to get to know you too with an audit. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So I put together these little mini get booked audits and this was born out of hearing from so many people that usually the, the biggest struggle they have is finding more clients. And so I thought, what would be the the easiest way to support people with this quickly for free? It doesn't cost a thing. And so essentially what we do for people that are interested and feeling like they really would benefit by having someone just kind of be able to have a bird's eyes view over everything they're doing in their business and give direct and quick feedback is we get on a quick zoom call and in 20 minutes, you tell me everything you're doing to currently attract and enroll clients. And I listen 
to all that you're doing. And then by the end of it, give you two or three things that you can tweak or optimize in your strategy now, um, which gives you a ton of clarity and moves you forward in your client attraction process. I love that. I absolutely love that because I think we need to do that quarterly and at least yearly because things change. Like your avatar can change, your messaging can change. So I'm sure that's so helpful for everybody. If somebody wanted to take a part of that, can we get a link Put that in the show notes? Thanks. That's incredible. This has been so much fun. Where can everybody get connected with you too? I am all over the interwebs. Stephanie has coaching. Okay. You can find me in most places. I would love to connect with anyone. Okay. Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. All yes. Yes. Normal social spots. Fantastic. Any last thoughts that you want to share with somebody who might be just starting out or even somebody who's thinking about scaling? Yeah, I would say connect to your heart, stay committed to your truth, honor your desires, tune back into your purpose when you feel lost or confused, choose joy and flow every day, Mm -hmm. and just figure out what works for you. When you can do more and more of those things and stay devoted to the mission and the vision of your calling, this is when pure magic can happen. I love that. I love that. What a great way to end an episode because I believe that we have the opportunity to make magic every day. All we have to do is choose it. Yeah. Awesome. Stephanie, thank you so much for being on. It's been a pleasure to get to know you and to have you here. And I'm looking forward to staying in touch. Mm, I can't wait for that. Thank you so much for having me, Emmy. Adore you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for being a listener of the Tribe of Leaders podcast. I am so grateful for each and every episode that you tune in and listen to. And I hope that you get a ton of value that you can implement starting today. And I do have just a quick favor. If you wouldn't mind hopping on to wherever it is that you listen to podcasts and leave us a rating and review, it would help us tremendously so that the Tribe of Leaders podcast can be found more easily and help inspire other entrepreneurial leaders. 